Congressman Lou represents the 33rd District of California. Congressman Ted Lou keeps us informed about COVID-19 updates and provides helpful resources on his websites in, and in his emails, the Lou Review. So hopefully you all get the Lou Review. If you don't, you should go to his website and sign up for it. Friday, the House of Representatives passed the HEROES Act, which he believes will help us address the challenges brought on by COVID-19. The act still needs to be passed by the Senate. So here, let us now go to Congressman Lou. He has till 3.30, we'll have him talk. We're going to do a, then a Q&A, and then we'll have the council members talk. Congressman Lou. Great, well, th thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And uh, so honored uh, to be with all of you today. I'm gonna to give you an update on the legislation that Congress has done. And then I'll talk to you about how I think we get out of this pandemic. And then I'll answer any questions that you may have. So we've passed four bipartisan bills and recently introduced a fifth one on Friday. Uh, the first bill we passed provided billions of dollars of money to try to find a cure, either through a vaccine or through a drug therapy. The second bill we did mandated free testing for everybody. It also provided provisions for emergency sick leave and emergency paid leave as well as provisions for food security uh, for uh, seniors and uh, for young people who don't have the same access to food. And the third bill we did was known as a CARES Act, and that had a number uh, of uh, provisions in there for businesses and families, including uh, the Paycheck Protection Loan for small businesses, and had stimulus checks going out to American families. We had over $340 billion going to cities and states, and we also had money going to testing and to hospitals and hospital systems. And then a few weeks ago, we passed an interim relief measure that increased funding to the Small Business Administration for the Paycheck Protection Loans. We also put in money for hospitals and additional money for testing. And then just on Friday, the House passed a $3 trillion HEROES Act uh, that has funding for states, local cities, uh, and school districts. Uh, as well as additional stimulus checks to American families and a number of other provisions, including $75 billion for testing and tracing. And hopefully uh, we can get that through. It's now uh, on the Senate side. My view of how we uh, get out of this pandemic is that we have to do three things. We've got to test, trace, and isolate. And so we have to ramp up testing at scale so that we can uh, make sure that everyone who is positive with COVID-19 is identified. And then we have to trace the contacts of uh, who may have been in contact with the person who tested positive, and then we have to isolate them. And that's how we can uh, suppress this virus, make sure it doesn't spread and reopen America safely. Uh, so we in Congress have put in a lot of resources uh, for testing and tracing. What we need is the executive branch to execute. And unfortunately the Trump administration uh, has been uh, not very competent. They've been behind, uh, and it's been a challenge trying to get them to execute uh, with all the resources that Congress has given them. Uh, so every day we try to uh, um, push on them to do better. So that's where we are, and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Oh, um, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Great. So uh, that gives us plenty of time. We have lots of questions. And as the way we're doing it is we got questions before the meeting. And as we uh, continue through the meeting, if you want to have a question for Congressman Lou, just put it on chat. And Carol, Carol Muller will be looking at those and, and adding, to, uh, uh, adding to the questions. I see that. Um, and so we will get your questions in. But anyway, I'm going to start with... We have a kind of grouped uh, our questions. So first one's having to do with the, we have some for the relief bills, but before we get to those, I wanted to uh, address uh, the November 2020 election and the vote by mail. Um, one of the questions that, because of what happened last week is, why do you think Christy Smith lost in the May 12th special election and what could Democrats have done better? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, historically, Democrats just tend to vote less in special elections. And we always knew this was going to be a challenge. So we do look forward to the November general election where the 
uh, turnout model is very different. Uh, you also had a lot of people right now who are much more concerned, uh, as they should be, about the pandemic and about the safety of their loved ones. And they're just not very focused on a special election on a uh, random date of May 12th. So we're hopeful for uh, November. I do want to point out um, uh, something about vote by mail. Uh, so I support vote by mail in a pandemic because I believe it's a safer way of voting. Uh, but I'm not sure it actually benefits Democrats. I think if you look at what happened in Wisconsin, where Democrats fought for vote by mail and Republicans rejected it, and then you look at what happened with the Chrissy Smith race, where it was virtually mostly vote by mail, uh, you'll see that Republicans end up doing a lot better in a race where it's primarily all vote by mail. And also historically, vote by mail happens to benefit Republicans more because um, it tends to skew older to people who are more comfortable uh, doing vote by mail. Uh, so again, I support it, but uh, to me, it's not at all clear that vote by mail actually helps Democrats. I think if you were to send a vote by mail ballot to every American in November, I think that would actually tend to help Republicans. Okay. Um, moving uh, back to the COVID-19 relief bill, what, is, what do you think will be the success of getting the HEROES Act through the Senate? Uh, so we have um, at least one Republican member of Congress who did support it, Peter King out of New York. We're trying to get more bipartisan support. And I think that you have a number of Republican governors who are now pushing on their Republican senators uh, to support the HEROES Act. It has $500 billion going out to states, $375 billion to local cities, and then an additional $90 billion going out to K through 12 school districts. Uh, and that's uh, really important to help our frontline uh, paramedics, firefighters, police officers, and first responders, uh, as well as our teachers. And I do uh, think that as uh, the weeks go by, there's going to be more and more pressure on the Senate to act. But it might go back to you to compromise. Is that correct? Or? Yes, uh, every bill has been a compromise. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this fifth one was also a compromise. Okay. Um, this is a little bit of a long question. It appears that the state, county, and city will cut spending in ways that will reduce employment and degrade infrastructure. This austerity will likely result in a downward economic spiral that will rival the decade plus long Great Depression. What specifically do you propose to do to counter the doom that may await us? Well, it's one reason the House passed the HEROES Act, $3 trillion to make sure that we don't spiral into a Great Depression. Uh, it is money into the uh, pockets of American workers. It's money uh, going out uh, to help the economy stabilize. So hopefully the Senate uh, will pass that. Uh, it is um, ironic uh, that the Republicans are opposed to this uh, because uh, this actually uh, would benefit Donald Trump. Uh, in terms of the economy. It would make the economy better if this were to pass. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, how, can, uh, how can we ensure that the COVID-19 relief bills are not handouts to the fossil fuel industry and instead promote, and instead promote transition to clean energy and support workers over, instead of supporting workers over big corporations? Uh, so the HEROES Act is pretty good. Uh, it had a lot of support in the Democratic caucus, including from progressives. Uh, so um, we'll see what happens when we uh, negotiate with the U.S. Senate. But as currently structured, it's, it's pretty good in terms of uh, how it distributes the funds. We're also working separately on an infrastructure bill. Uh, I believe that's how we uh, go into the recovery stage of this pandemic. Uh, we're not yet there. I think we still have to make sure we suppress the virus and keep it from spreading. And then when we start to recover, uh, we have to have a large infrastructure package. And in that package, we have to focus on green technology and green energy and transition to uh, renewable energies instead of fossil fuels. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I have a go back because I just saw a chat thing. So I'm just do a little bit of a go back to this austerity. In terms of the HEROES Act, um, 
how will it in specific help the local cities and state? You know, because we're seeing that the you know they have to balance their budget, how, and they're and they're right. already doing cuts. Yeah. So the Heroes Act provides five hundred billion dollars to states, three hundred seventy-five billion dollars to local cities, and then an additional ninety billion dollars to K through twelve school districts. So. In terms of, for example, Redondo Beach, uh, if this act were to pass without any changes, the city of Redondo Beach would get approximately $20 billion split between this year and next year. Okay, thank you. Um, this one has uh, been in the news a little bit. Are Trump properties benefiting from the stimulus bill? Is there a way that we could oversee the, the recipients of Trump handouts from this fund? Right. I'm sorry, I meant 20 million, uh, not 20 billion uh, for the city. Oh. Yeah. So I'm sorry, can I... you say that again? Right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. But you could repeat that question again, uh, that'd be great. This one had to do with the Trump properties benefiting from the stimulus bills and with the oversight, he keeps firing the people who are, over, who are doing the oversight. Uh, what's the transparency for us seeing the recipients of, the, of handouts to Trump properties? So the House uh, has created a, a coronavirus subcommittee specifically to uh, oversee, uh, do oversight on how the executive branch is spending uh, the coronavirus funds. Uh, it is a bipartisan committee, and um, that's one way we're doing it. Also, in the CARES Act, we did put in oversight provisions. The president, in signing the bill, said he was not going to comply with that. I don't even understand how that's constitutional. So it's going to be litigated. Uh, unfortunately, the court system is slow. Uh, so it'll be a while before we get a result. Okay. Um, can, when can we expect standardized COVID testing with reliable results? That's a great question. I've been asking the CDC since February what our error rate is for these COVID-19 tests. And I've also written them in letters. Uh, they have not answered that question. I finally got a letter back last week uh, where they still did not answer that question. So I can't tell if they don't know what the answer is or if they're afraid of giving the their range for the error rate. But if you look at various news articles, you see that uh, some of them uh, show that these tests could have very high error rates, especially the rapid uh, testing uh, uh, mechanisms, yeah. some of them could have an error rate of uh, nearly 30 to 50 percent, which sort of makes it uh, sort of ludicrous uh, to you. So we'll try and get to the bottom of this, and uh, we keep asking the CDC, and hopefully we'll get a, uh, uh, an actual answer soon. Uh, I'm going to jump over to a personal question. Who do you know in Congress who has COVID? And how are your staff and friends and neighbors doing? Do you know any of them that have contacted the COVID virus? So there's been media articles uh, that have talked about some of the members of Congress that uh, had it. So Congressman Ben McAdams had it pretty early on from Utah. Uh, he got pretty sick from it. Uh, thank goodness he's recovered. Congresswoman Nadia Velasquez uh, got COVID. Uh, she has recovered. Um, there are some Republican members that also got COVID. Uh, they have all recovered. Uh, in terms of uh, our staff, uh, we are all working remotely, but our offices are open. So if any of you have um, issues with federal agencies, please let me uh, or any of my staff members know, and uh, we will assist you. And, and neighbors or family, I mean, are, are you, do you have any close contact with people who just... Uh, well, we are all safe and healthy. Yeah, good. Because what I find is when I'm out also is that the people who are who who sus suspect this is a hoax are people who have no know nobody, you know, don't know anybody that has has it. Right. Okay, okay I'm gonna uh, jump back to uh, an election one. Um, what Senate and House elections do you think are the most important to support to ensure a Democratic House and Senate majority? 
so in the house uh, many of you helped uh to flip it last term so thank you for that uh, i was um, a vice chair of the DCCC last term and my responsibility was the western region which included california and we uh targeted seven seats that hillary clinton had won in the general election in which a republican member of congress held that seat and we flipped all seven of them uh, with your help this time uh every single one of those districts is still close we have to help uh, all of those members uh, so we have to get Christy Smith in in November. We also have to re-elect Josh Harder, TJ Cox, Gil Cisneros, Mike Levin, Katie Porter, and Harley Ruda. Um, in terms of uh, the U.S. Senate, we have a much better map than we did last term. Uh, right now, we are ahead. Our candidates are ahead in Arizona and in Maine and in Colorado. We're essentially tied uh, in North Carolina, we're slightly ahead in Montana, and then we've got to hold uh, Doug Jones' seat in Alabama. So those are the states I would focus on. Okay, I'm just gonna ask a few more questions, and then we're gonna go to the chat. I do have more, but I wanted to get the, the ones that are in. Um, did you know Chase Bank was sending emails notifying clients they were freezing funds to demand repayment for EIDL loans on Friday? Um, I did not know that. And if um, you have an issue with that, please contact uh, my staff and uh, we'll assist you with it. Okay. Um, there was another one. This has to do with uh, a little off topic. Uh, Chinese, the, China's uh, military pressure. In view of China's increased military pressure throughout East Asia, what is your view of the continuance of increased military aid to Taiwan? So both Republican and Democratic administrations uh, have supported Taiwan. Uh, I have always supported um, the administration in supporting Taiwan, whether it's Republican or Democratic uh, administration. I'm also part of the Taiwan Caucus. And so uh, in terms of support for Taiwan, uh, I, I have uh, always been supportive. Okay, so I'm gonna go over to Carol. She's been uh, or, uh, writing down the chat questions. Carol? Um. Well, I think you might have answered about uh, USPS help uh, in the latest bill. Um, do we have hope, help for the post office in the latest bill and also hope, help for vote by mail for facilitating that? Yes, so there's money in the HEROES Act uh, to help uh, stabilize the post office. And by the way, I have no idea why Donald Trump is going after the post office. Uh, it seems like uh, an insane strategy for the election if you want to go ahead and raise rates uh, on home delivery and raise rates on business delivery and raise rates on postage. Um, I'm not sure why you think that's a winning issue. Uh, and by the way, if you told UPS or FedEx that they had to deliver an envelope for 55 cents anywhere in America, they would also go bankrupt. Uh, so the post office has a very different mission. Uh, most members of Congress understand that and the HEROES Act has money uh, to stabilize the post office because we're asking it uh, to deliver everywhere in the United States at 55 cents an envelope, uh, which is very difficult to do. Uh, in terms of vote by mail, Heroes Act also has money in there uh, to help states with vote by mail. Again, I support it. I also personally believe it tends to benefit Republicans. Hmm. Okay. Um, this is asking about the role of electronic footprints in COVID tracing. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with uh, exactly uh, what the question means, but I'm throwing it out there. It was in chat. So to do contact tracing, there are different ways to do it. It would be easier if you could do it electronically. And so, um, for example, uh, if you had a cell phone and then folks are looking at cell phone, know where you Your were. Your screen is frozen. 
no, is it moving now? No, it's good. Hmm. You're good. Okay, so if someone could look at your cell phone and know where you were in the last 14 days, that would help in contact tracing. It also has some severe privacy implications. And so that's something that I think people are trying to think through and, and work through. Uh, in South Korea, for example, when you go to a restaurant, um, they're trying something out where uh, basically they take down your information so that if it turned out that someone was, po was positive, they could notify the people at the table uh, that you ate with uh, and other people uh, you interacted with. Uh, that would absolutely be helpful for contact tracing. Again, it also has privacy implications not sure that people would want to give that information out at a restaurant. So, so I don't know. It is a difficult question. Um, and it's something that we're just going to have to work through. Um, I, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. It's simply going to be a trade-off between how much privacy you want to give up and how effective you want the contact tracing to be. Do you have another one, Carol, or you want me to go? Did we lose Carol? I, I think we lost Carol. Okay, I'll, I'll continue. Um, this one has to do uh, uh, let me see. Uh, hold on. Will, I, I didn't hear you say this, but maybe you did. Will there be, in the HEROES Act, will there be able to make the vaccine for COVID free for all Americans? And will this patent be, be made available free to the world to stop the future ways of the pandemic? Let me check exactly what the provisions say uh, in terms of vaccine cost. Um, essentially, if, if you make it free, what you're essentially saying is that the federal government's going to pay for it. That's basically what, right. what that means. So let me look into the HEROES Act. I'm not exactly sure how that, how those provisions are structured, and we'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, along that line, uh, will the bill ensure open enrollment for ACA plans to people who lost their jobs? Yes, the bill has that. Uh, it also has provisions to subsidize COBRA as well. Oh, both, wow. both, both, both those choices are available. So that's only in this new bill? Yes. Oh, okay. correct. Great. Um, yeah, I, uh, Connie's just saying the swine flu epidemic vaccinations were free. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, there, uh, I have one about um, so there was a little bit on the news. I think it was taken out of context where someone was asked about with the with the pandemic, was there a chance that the election would get delayed, the November election get delayed? And and I think the answer was it has to go through legislation in order for that to happen. I don't think he I don't think Trump has that ability. Is that true? That's correct. The statute would have to be changed. And I don't see the House of Representatives doing that at all. Okay. So, okay. Um, so in that it doesn't get delayed and we do have a good election, um, can Trump be censored in the lame duck session? I think I've heard you've been asked this before in the November through January and you were going to look into that. Yes, he could be. Yes, oh. absolutely. Oh, okay. All right. So this is a, another, this is a local one, and I don't, this came from a, another one of our members, and I don't know if Connie was going to also ask this, but um, your actions in community efforts to rid Los Angeles of the modified hydrofluoric acid at two refineries and your leadership is very appreciative. Assuming the passing of the passing of COVID Trumpism storms, which have increased threats of MHF release, what federal path do you recommend post January 21st? 
so, so uh, I want to thank everyone on this call who's uh, assisted in that effort. Um, if we flip the Senate, um, as was the White House, and I think there is a path to do some good legislation. Uh, if that doesn't happen, Republicans would, would basically block any legislation um, that negatively affects refineries. And so it's going to be up to uh, the AQMD and uh, the local uh, governments to take action. So um, hopefully we do well in November. And then if we do, uh, please circle back with me. Okay. Uh, speaking of November again, what worries you most about election security, Russian manipulation, and prospects for voting in November? So um, there's sort of two main ways uh, for our elections to be influenced. One is through uh, straight up hacking, uh, either of voting machines or a, a voter databases and so on. Uh, so it, it's possible that that could happen. It is also much harder. Uh, one of the uh, reasons is because we have a very messy election system. We don't have one national election. We have 50 states with all these different counties and local precinct officials and 50 different secretaries of state, none of whom wants their election hacked. And so it's hard to systematically hack uh, a presidential election. If you gave a hacker a voting machine um, and gave them, you know, an entire day by themselves, uh, yeah, they could hack it. But normally, hackers don't have that kind of access to voting machines. Uh, so in, in the real world, it's not that easy to go ahead and uh, sort of basically through hacking uh, make a huge amount of difference in a national election. Uh, what is much more problematic is what I call influence campaigns. Uh, PSYOPs, also known as psychological operations, that Russians and, and other foreign governments engage in. And that's very difficult to stop because of our free and open society, uh, because of our First Amendment. And so in 2016, they were very effective in having these troll farms uh, where they would uh, just put out all sorts of messages. And a lot of Americans would think they were reading a post from you know someone in their neighborhood uh, when in fact it was someone from the Kremlin uh, and that's going to continue and so that's uh, difficult to stop and really the only way to stop that is with more speech uh, on our side. Now the good news uh, is that studies have shown that the American public now trusts social media much less which is helpful so now when they see a post on Facebook or Twitter they might not immediately assume it's true they might assume okay, maybe this is not true, or maybe it is uh, a Russian troll. Uh, second thing that's happened is campaigns learn. And so Democrats have learned from 2016, and now uh, we are also doing a lot of different things on the internet and on Twitter and on Facebook. So what's going to happen in November, or actually starting now, leading in November, is people are going to get inundated with all sorts of messages, but now it's going to be from both sides. And uh, that would actually make things somewhat better as well. Thank you. Uh, just as a follow up on that, what do you think is the most important thing the parties, it's from chat, from the chat, uh, the most important thing the party's grassroots can do to ensure that Joe Biden is elected president in November? Uh, I would focus on the swing states of. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina. Uh, if Joe Biden wins Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, nearly impossible for Donald Trump to win. He'd have to take essentially a blue state and flip it. If Joe Biden uh, wins Michigan, Pennsylvania loses Wisconsin, but can win either Florida or Arizona, same issue, nearly impossible for Donald Trump to win because he had to flip a blue state. So uh, I would focus on those swing states. Uh, and I think that's, our, that's Biden's clearest path to reelection in November. And a follow up to that one, what is your response to Obamagate? 
Oh, um, I don't even know what it is, and I don't think <laughs> Donald Trump knows what it is either. Uh, he was asked at a press conference. Uh, he couldn't really explain it. And then when you look at his tweets, he just says Obamagate. Uh, he doesn't explain it. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really uh, – first, I don't think most people in America actually pay much attention to that. Um, I think people are still very focused on the pandemic and on protecting themselves and their loved ones, as well as how do they you know, get the economy going again and reopen safely.